So, Yuri, great to have you back, always. Thank I you. I find myself always interviewing you in a tux. Um, so, thank you for doing this again. This is the seventh year. You great, Holson. Thank you. Um, seventh year of the Breakthrough Prize. And I'm curious, after seven years, do you feel that the investment and the exposure that you've provided these scientists has really helped move science forward? Well, uh, we recognize those scientists post factum so they've done their discoveries uh, that's what they're being recognized for uh, what we believe uh, this prize can catalyze is the public acceptance of science as an amazing achievement we want to create a platform for scientists to become celebrities uh, similar to athletes and uh, performers and entertainers uh, we all recognize and you only need to look at social media to, uh, to realize that uh, scientists are not being celebrated, you know, they are doing amazing things, but nobody knows about them. So that's really a number one goal for this prize. The second goal is inspire young generation to choose science as their career, and I think we are making progress there as well. So, of the prizes being awarded tonight, what are the discoveries that you're most excited about? Well, uh, I would say. Uh, maybe, I mean, they're all exciting, but the one that really I feel uh, is very special is the physics prize, which uh, is being awarded to Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and she is an uh, incredible scientist from UK. Uh, he made uh, a seminal discovery uh, of pulsars, those are special types of stars, fast rotating. And uh, she was not quite recognized uh, at the time of the discovery. And now this recognition is catching up with her. Um, it's sort of like a lifetime achievement prize. Uh, but I'm very happy uh, the kind of attention she received from media was really uh, incredible. And uh, this is one of those reasons why we launched this prize. So we want the scientists to get all the attention. Um, and maybe that would create a basis for them to become celebrities of sorts. Is the goal to be the Nobel Prize in a century? Well, we're not directly competing with other <laughs> prizes, but, uh, but people uh, call us the Oscars of science. It's a slightly different aspect, uh, uh, but I think uh, it's uh, meaningful because I guess we need to use the means of the 21st century to promote science and you know the event is one of those means I also believe that we uh, uh, can uh, use social media and other instruments that were not there hundred years ago when Nobel Prize was really invented uh, which obviously achieved great recognition you mentioned uh, research on the edges of, of space I'm curious about your thoughts on the private space race happening now between whether it's Elon Musk or, or Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson. You know, I know you've always been fascinated by space. How do you see that private space race playing out? Okay, well, we have a couple of initiatives there too. You know, one is called Starshot. Um, this is uh, as opposed to the one the ones mentioned by Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Branson. This one is really focusing on interstellar travel. You know, they are focusing on our solar system. You know, chemical fuel is really the way to move around the solar system, but that's not going to work in interstellar travel. So the initiative that we are funding called Starshot, it is really uh, trying to determine whether we have a feasible technology to move between stars. And the distances there are much, much bigger. And uh, that's what we're working on. What's been the progress? Well, uh, this is a two years old initiative. We are, we have committed hundred million dollars to fund R&D phase. This will probably take another five, seven years. And by the time we'll be able to tell you whether this uh, is a feasible uh, and realistic to achieve this objective uh, in the next 25, 30 years. So you're not competing with Elon Musk no. and Jeff Bezos necessarily. No. Well, you know, the universe is much bigger than just our solar system. If you could put your bet on one of them, who would it be? Well, I mean, they are all uh, targeting different, you know, they all have their different objectives. You know, Elon is 
mostly focused on Mars. Jeff Bezos is uh, focused on uh, near-Earth, you know, orbits and moving industries there and things like that. Uh, Branson, I think, is interested in tourism. I think they're all slightly different, and the space is so big, so we need more of those. Um, you started this prize with, with Mark Zuckerberg, and you were an early backer of Facebook. Facebook's in a sort of existential crisis right now. He, Mark has said the next big pivot is going to be towards video, towards messaging. How optimistic are you about further growth in Facebook and social networks in general, given saturation, given privacy concerns, given this existential crisis? Well, first of all, I don't agree that it's an existential crisis. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think it's a little bump on the road. <laughs> I think that uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram are amazing products uh, with uh, more than a billion people each. So you can't really dismiss it <laughs> as an existential crisis. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, Facebook always was and is an evolving system. And they've always been responding to challenges. And uh, the uh, challenges that they are facing can be solved uh, through a combination of human, uh, human attention and uh, artificial intelligence elements. Uh, so, you know, there are always bad actors who are testing different products. Um, but I think, I feel confident that uh, this will be taken care of uh, through technology you know, it's a technology company. Run by humans. Run by humans. Who have to make the right decisions, right? Yes. So does it concern you that, you know, the privacy, the hacking, the potential election meddling, the fact that the founders of all the companies that you mentioned that Facebook bought have gone, one of them even tried to start a delete Facebook movement? Well, uh, everything should be put in perspective. If you look at other companies that did acquisitions, the founders of these companies stayed for an amazingly long time. I mean, it should be compared to other acquisitions. You know, it's very often happens that founders are gone in 12 months or in six months. You know, here I think they've spent, they've stayed long enough to ensure continuity and transition. And I think those products will do very well uh, going forward. Do you think that Facebook and Twitter, which is another company you backed, are living up to the expectations of people living in democracies, users living in democracies? Well, uh, democracy is an open system. It has this amazing, incredible achievement, which is called free speech. And there will always be bad actors who are abusing this gift that, uh, that has been given to them. So I think that uh, you know, what really the amazing thing that happened is that hundreds of millions of people got their voice. And not all voices are, you know, for the good. <laughs> so if you have a uh, hundred million people who are being heard and who are spreading uh, their amazing experiences and doing good to the world and then maybe a thousand voices that are you know that are bad actors maybe sometimes a bit more sophisticated than the good actors <laughs> and that's why we spend so much time on discussing them but but I really care about this hundreds of millions of people who got their voices around the world and who have done so many amazing things using their voice. I know you've tried to keep your head above politics, but the geopolitical tensions, has that made your job more difficult as a bridge between Russia and Silicon Valley? Well, I've never been a bridge <laughs> between Russia and Silicon Valley, and never wanted to be. Um, but in a way you have. I mean, I don't know about that. Created uh, relationships uh, and, and connections. You know, I've uh, built a company in, in, uh, in Russia, which is called Mail. I think this company is uh, doing exactly what other social media has done around the world, meaning this company gave voice to dozens of millions of people. 
Uh, and then I started investing globally um, in places like China, India, US. We've been very fortunate to call some good investments. Um, so I, I think that uh, it's not really about building bridges, but I think it's about pursuing global agenda. That's the way I see my mission. And by the way, science is um, another platform which is intrinsically global. Um, our investments are completely business driven and uh, uh, I think it's uh, spread out around the world roughly proportionate to the significance of technology which is being built around the world. Yeah. So, so, if, so if someone were to say to you, did the Russians meddle in the election? Do you believe they did? How do you answer that? I am, I'm reading the same magazines and the newspapers as you're reading, so I have no special expertise here. SoftBank has a lot of money in the tech ecosystem, and the Saudis and the Saudi government have a lot of money in SoftBank. There's a lot of controversy around it, given the murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Do you think it's a problem that SoftBank has so much money in the, in the tech ecosystem? Well, I think we should be judging people uh, based on the laws and uh, the global situations that were at the time when they were making those investments and making those decisions. So going forward, things may be different. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, people are learning as they go. And uh, we, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, the last time we have been uh, uh, taking money from uh, Russian investors was in 2011. So, and that was, you made things, a choice. Many things, many things have uh, changed since then, and uh, our investor base is very global uh, since that time. And you made a purposeful decision to not take money from Russian investors. Well, we've made a very conscious decision to diversify our uh, investor base. And by the way, the main motivation for this was because our investments are global. It's kind of logical for us to have a very global investor base. Just one more question. You've invested in you know, Facebook and Alibaba and Flipkart. What do you think is the next big thing in technology? And where is the next big thing in terms of the hot region for tech investment? Well, uh, if you look at the previous 10 years, um, if you add US and China, that would be 90% of all uh, uh, value that was created in, in internet. Uh, Europe is around 3%, the rest of the world around 7%. So logically speaking, you would think that Europe should be doing much better in the future, uh, sort of catching up with, uh, with uh, US and China. Uh, I think China can increase their share uh, as you know, Chinese companies go global. I think it's uh, uh, not inconceivable to see more value accruing to Chinese companies. I think more than uh, there US is in companies. The United States? You need. I don't. Well, that remains to be seen. But but I think the amazing success that the U.S. companies have enjoyed in the last 15, 20 years was really based on the fact that those are global companies. And what about technology? What's beyond smartphones and social networks and AI, or is it AI? Well, uh, it is AI, yes, I would agree with you. <laughs> and AI really cutting across uh, pretty much horizontally across uh, all technologies and uh, you know, each significant company will become AI company. Is Uber worth $120 billion? We will see next year.